Russia's invasion of Ukraine has caused thousands of deaths and destroyed entire cities. Western countries have answered Kyiv's pleas for military aid. Does this mean the conflict has become an international one? And what are the risks of escalation to a wider war? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Foli Batibo. The war in Ukraine has reached a scale that hasn't been seen in Europe since World War II. Before the invasion in February 2022, the West's main weapon against Russia was sanctions. But a year later, many Western nations are sending arms and military equipment to Ukraine. While the war rages, Kyiv has been winning battles on the diplomatic front. Berlin has finally given the green light for German-made Leopard 2 tanks to be deployed. But just as that agreement was reached, Ukraine's focus has shifted to other weapons like aircraft. The key now is speed and volume, the speed of training our military, the speed of supplying tanks to Ukraine, the amount of tank support. We have to form a fist of tanks, a fist of freedom, which will not allow tyrannies rise again. We have to open the supply of long-range missiles to Ukraine. And it is important that we expand our cooperation in artillery. And we have to start supplying aircraft to Ukraine. This is our dream and our task. While some Western nations have criticized Germany for the delay in sending battle tanks to Ukraine, it's a result of internal political division. Some politicians are wary of military involvement abroad and the risk of wider conflicts. We have provided aid, as have others, financially, humanitarian, and also with arms deliveries. That is our obligation. At the same time, we've done everything we can to prevent the conflict from escalating, because that would affect the whole world if it led to a war. Now, Russia says that by supplying Ukraine with arms, Western countries are directly involved in the conflict. Both European capitals and Washington keep saying that the delivery of various kinds of weapon systems, including tanks, to Ukraine absolutely does not mean the involvement of these countries or the NATO alliance in the hostilities going on in Ukraine. We categorically disagree with that. Moscow views everything that the alliance and the capitals I've mentioned are doing as direct involvement in the conflict. We can see it growing. So where are the weapons coming from? More than 30 Western nations have sent arms and military equipment since the beginning of the war. The U.S. is the largest single contributor, pledging more than $25 billion. Germany is next, followed by the U.K. They've promised missiles, rocket launchers, drones, battle tanks and other armored vehicles. Russia has been using Iranian drones, which it says were bought before the war. The U.S. has accused North Korea of supplying weapons to the Russians, something Pyongyang denies. NATO is also widening its call for military support for Ukraine. On a visit to South Korea, NATO's chief Jens Stoltenberg asked his hosts to follow the example of Germany, Sweden and Norway and change its policy on supplying weapons abroad. The U.S. has been supplying weapons from its stockpile in Israel. Well, let's bring in our guests now for today's show. In Cork, we have Jeffrey Roberts, who's Emeritus Professor of History at the University College Cork. From Bath, we're joined by Patrick Bury, a senior lecturer in security at Bath University. He's also a former British Army officer and former NATO advisor. And in Mallorca is Benjamin Tallis, a senior research fellow at the Alfred von Oppenheim Center for the Future of Europe, which is based in Berlin. A warm welcome to you all. Thank you so much for joining us. Jeffrey Roberts in Cork, let me start with you. As we approach the first anniversary of the Ukraine war, we've seen massive Western military aid to Kyiv. Is the arming of Ukraine by the West bringing us ever closer to a wider international war? Are Western countries now effectively directly involved in this conflict? Well, they're certainly directly involved in the conflict. They're supplying military aid, they're supplying intelligence, they're training Ukrainian troops. There may be special forces involved directly in the conflict. Um, yeah, the, 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 the Ukraine war is already an international conflict and the West is deeply involved in it. Um, this latest step, is, is another escalatory step, quite clearly. But what worries me about is not so much the actual practical 
uh, proposals or practical um, policy that's been decided. Uh, it, it, that doesn't worry me so much because I, I doubt that um, all this new equipment that's been promised will actually reach the battlefield in time and in sufficient uh, quantities to actually uh, make a significant difference to the situation in the crime. But what does worry me about is all the talk that's surrounding uh, these new supplies and, and the talk that's preceding them, and I need more now, is that the West can do what it likes in relation to, to Ukraine. Uh, Western hardlines are saying that Putin has no, uh, uh, has, has no red lines. Uh, we can do whatever we want. We shouldn't be intimidated by any threats coming from the Russian side. We should do whatever it takes to make sure uh, uh, that, that, you, that Ukraine uh, w uh, wins this war. So what that points to is a, a further escalation. Uh, you know, what's going to be next? Zelensky is demanding long-range missiles, mm. aircraft. Maybe direct Western involvement. Yeah, so so it, it, it's it's a very very worrying different right. uh, 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 development from the point of view of the logic of escalation okay. that's developing uh, in relation to the Ukraine war. Patrick Bury, do you agree with Jeffrey, who says that we are already in an international conflict and that this could lead to a wider escalation? In fact, the supplying of weapons by the West to Kiev. Well, listen, it's an international war when two states go to war against each other. Um, that is simple as that. So Russia invaded Ukraine and it's an international war. Uh, listen, I do, yeah, with, with Jeff, of course. Um, and he's right. There are people in the West, just as there are in Russia, you know, calling for, well, you know, really quite harebrained approaches, you know, um, and whether it's the use of nuclear weapons inside Ukraine or whether it's the people, especially in the States, who think that you can really lean into this without any consideration of the of your enemy, essentially, and just go for broke. Um, there's a whole piece here, of course, about how did we get up, get into this situation, which both the West and Ukraine have contributed to. But so, unfortunately, has Russia. And Russia has now exposed itself by invading and crossing uh, into Ukraine and trying to subjugate the country, exposed itself to um, to the consequences of that action. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so it, it's the one that sort of took the leap from the, from the, from the situation being... Uh, relatively stable to being into an international war. But do you think, uh, do you and, think that we're of... looking, because Jeffrey seems to say that we are heading towards a wider conflict. Yes, international between Ukraine and Russia, but we are heading into a wider conflict, he says, that could involve perhaps other countries directly. I, I don't see that yet. Uh, the theory of war pulls us towards extremes and the practical uh, practicalities of war. For example, you send tanks, but then to protect the tanks, you need jets to, to fly overhead to keep the Russian Air Force away. It pulls to escalation, too. Um, I think, though, on the other hand, actually the people in charge, rather than some of those pushing narratives, have been very, very cautious. Look how long it's taken. You know, Ukraine was asking for tanks back in March 2022. It was asking for Patriot Air defence back in March 2022. Uh, all, all they got was handheld javelins and anti-tank guns and, and st uh, stingers, etc., and body armour. So it's been a slow process. Um, but I think the problem is really here from a NATO perspective, they have to, they've got a very credible ally who's fighting for their own territory against uh, an invading force, which has broken international law. So in, in some ways, if you don't stand up for your values here, what do you do? Mm. Interesting. Let me get uh, Benjamin's thoughts on this. There's been a lot of debate within Germany, of course, Benjamin, about whether they should be involved uh, more in the Ukraine conflict. There was a lot of discussion about whether or not to supply these Leopard 2 tanks to, to Ukraine, which the Chancellor was opposed to. W what is the biggest concern for Germans today in regards to this conflict? Well, actually, I think the biggest concern for a lot of Germans, uh, if we're talking about the public, is that their government is not doing enough and not doing enough quickly enough to support Ukraine, which they see as clearly being in uh, Germany's interest to do. Now, that's not necessarily been the position of the Schultz Chancellery, who have been very reluctant and hesitant, and the, uh, the cost of their delaying can be measured in Ukrainian lives. These tanks have been requested since April last year when the Czech Republic and Poland first supplied main battle tanks to, to Ukraine. And it's 10 months later um, that they've actually been given the go ahead. Mm. There's, there are concerns. There are concerns about escalation uh, and all the way up to nuclear escalation. But a lot of people feel as though that's just uh, falling into Russia's nuclear blackmail trap. There's other, other issues at hand as well, though, which... Um, Several politicians here, as well as analysts, have questioned whether the Schultz Chancellery actually wants Ukraine to win a decisive victory. Now, many allies think that's really important uh, to show that actually uh, we, the alliance is defending democracy and standing up for what's what's right in the world. 
but they recognize also the transformatory potential of this conflict should one side uh, have a decisive victory. And but that, why, wouldn't seems, the Germans, the Shor- why wouldn't the Germans, why wouldn't the Germans, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Ed, because that's very interesting what you say there, why wouldn't the Germans want a direct uh, victory uh, for, a decisive victory, sorry, for Ukraine? Yeah, it's not the Germans. It's very clearly the Schultz Chancellery and a faction of the SPD, the Social Democratic Party here, uh, or in Germany, rather. Um, Because, uh, and it's important to say they don't want Ukraine to lose either. That's not the position. But they don't want a decisive victory. Why? Because that actually potentially has what we would call a system-transforming effect, uh, whereby the competition between democracies and autocracies uh, intensifies. And you really have to stand up and be counted and choose sides. And that might have all sorts of implications for Germany's trade relations with with China, for example. Mm -hmm. And we see the Schultz Chancellery clinging to the world of yesterday, uh, where they could do business with who they wanted. They could outsource their energy to Russia, their security to the US and trade to China. And that's not going to be a viable proposition if Ukraine wins a decisive victory, which is what a lot of the allies... uh, So is that that why we saw reluctance from the German government to, to supply these weapons to Ukraine? I think it's been one of the main reasons behind it. Yes, there have been so many reasons given that have evaporated into excuses over the course of the war. But that, to me, strikes me as the most plausible reason behind the uh, delay. OK. Jeffrey, let me come back to you and pick up on something you said earlier. You talked about Putin's red lines. What do you think could tip him over the edge? What would be his red lines? Well, well no, no one knows what uh, Putin's red lines are. And uh, we don't actually want to... To test out what they are because the consequences of miscalculating what whatever what his red lines would be would be absolutely catastrophic and of course the main victim of that miscalculation if we did cross Putin's uh, red lines and there was a, a major escalation of the war the main victim of that miscalculation uh, 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 would be Ukraine I think Putin has acted with his strength because uh, from his point of view, from the Russian point of view, they're winning the war and they are going to win the war. So uh, there's no need for them to uh, counter-escalate uh, every 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 move by the West. But that calculation could change, and that that's that's what worries me. Um, I, 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 you responded to Benjamin there. Yeah, I think the other reason that Schultz was reluctant um, to 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 take this step of agreeing to supply heavy tanks, uh, apart from the danger of escalation, was that public opinion in Germany, as it is in every country throughout, uh, throughout Europe, throughout the Western world, is divided uh, on, on the Ukraine war. Yes, there are those who, uh, who are in favour of escalation and doing whatever it takes uh, to, to win the war against Russia and, and to take the necessary risk. But there are, but there are others um, uh, uh, who, who, want, who, want, who prefer a diplomatic solution to the war, who want, who want a ceasefire, want to see the war end and settle. And right. end and settle. I, I, I'm afraid, you know, I'm responding to what Patrick said, I just I wish I could share his confidence in the powers that be that, that they're going to control this process. Um, because all the way through the war, it, it's just been one escalatory step after another. Okay, it's been slow and it's been gradual, but nevertheless, um, it, you know, the, 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 the direction of travel uh, is, uh, uh, yeah, is, is, uh, is, is, quite, is, quite, is quite clear. Okay. So what are they going to do next? Right. Let's, uh, is, let's it, ask are Patrick, they gonna st- is this the last decision? Patrick, what is your response to that? And Patrick, are you convinced that Putin uh, is going to back away from, from a major escalation uh, with the West if these, these weapons supplies continue to, to go ahead? No, I'm not convinced. And, mm. and uh, you know, it's it's down to his uh, his assessment of the situation. Uh, but I do think it's being as carefully calibrated as it can be. Um, certainly, it can't come fast enough for the Ukrainians. It's too slow. Even the tanks are too slow. They're going to have to use their own reserves uh, to hold a line while these new tanks come on stream. But ultimately, you know, I think Putin is going to have to decide, you know, that there's the rules of the game here, essentially, which is if I conventionally invade another country and other people come to that country's aid conventionally to help get t- turfed out, I have to accept that because that's the net that the goes with the territory of invading another country. Yeah. Mm. And we saw that in, 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 in the Middle East, you know, look at Iran after the invasion of Iraq, for example. You know, this is just what goes on. Now, that's the, the rules of the game is you don't use nukes. Yeah. And when you do, if you're going to start threatening them, you have to go through the clear signals of getting your strategic nuclear forces ready. And I think the most actually dangerous point of view, well, if, if Ukraine starts to inflict a number of another, say, a double operational blow on Russia this summer, 
then you're into a series where it would essentially show up the Russian uh, military, the ground forces, as, as incapable, really, you right. know? And, and then that's quite, quite, quite a, a risky situation, much less so than if, if the... If those, if the F sixteens uh, go in, you know, a squadron of F sixteens go in to protect Ukrainian offensives. Well, if the Russian air force can't deal with that in, over Ukraine, that's the Russian air force's what problem. What difference are and, these and new weapons going to make? You think, uh, Patrick? These new d weapons are they going to help Ukraine regain some of the ter some of the territory it lost? Well, that's the, the the clear thing here now is the Ukrainians need to uh, weather a, a very hard period, probably as you as Russia. Most likely, you know, between the spring and summer tries to attack somewhere. Yeah, they're going to have to weather that. And then, you know, if you look at what our armoured brigades are for, which is essentially what's being pledged and will come, come on stream, but it will take time. Armoured brigades are for finding a weak spot and punching through to take back territory. And it was an armoured brigade that punched through around Kharkiv in mm -hmm. August, September. That's what it's for. There's a few places they can attack in the east, in, in the centre around Zaporizhia or into Crimea, all of which, yes, can carry escalatory uh, responses, of course. But uh, it's essentially, if you don't view the problem as like a, a belligerent here has invaded another sovereign nation, notwithstanding all the things that happened before that, but once that's happened, yeah, um, then, then you know, this is this is the rules of the game. Right. Uh, before I bring in Benjamin back, Jeffrey, I just wanted to ask you what you thought of you know these new weapons that have been supplied. Do you think they'll they'll make a big difference on the ground? Will they change the strategic uh, situation on the ground? It, it, it's hard to tell, <clears throat> um, um, but but what we do know is this: is that there's been a whole series of Western wonder weapons uh, throughout the war. You know, starting off with. Um, uh, you know, uh, javelin anti uh, anti tank missiles, you know, Turkish drones, high mass, uh, triple M sevens, and now it's these heavy tanks. And all these these successive waves of wonder weapons were supposed to change uh, the, the direction of the war strategically in Ukraine's favour, uh, but it, they haven't worked. Um, so far, the Russians have destroyed thousands, thousands mm -hmm. of uh, Ukrainian tanks and, and armored cars. And is there any reason to expect they're not going to be able to deal uh, with, with this latest wave? You know, I, I, before I came on this program, I, I was worried. I was worried. Can I just make this point? I was worried about sure. uh, the escalation problem. Listening to Patrick, listening to Patrick <laughs> and Benjamin, I'm even more worried now because that's exactly the kind of discourse that's actually leading us into uh, an all uh, the West into an all out okay. war, war, war with Russia. Let's allow Benjamin to respond. Benjamin. Thanks very much indeed. Yeah, there's uh, an interesting discussion. A couple of points I'd really like to uh, to pick up on. One, there is only one escalatory party in this war, and there's only one party to blame for this war, which is Russia. Ukraine's dis uh, desire to join a voluntary sphere of integration, NATO and the, the European Union, is totally different than Russia's attempt to impose a sphere of influence on it. And that's precisely what democratic countries have reacted to. Ukraine is fighting a defensive war, and by the way, it's winning it, so I'm really going to push back very strongly against Jeffrey's unfounded assertion that uh, Russia is somehow winning this conflict. The Russian military has been humiliated in Ukraine, um, fighting a far smaller force. They've actually failed to achieve most of their objectives. They're being pushed out of the territory they have taken, and that's part, in part due to the weapons the West has provided, but in other part due to the bravery, courage, ingenuity, and skill of the Ukrainian army and the, the resilience of its people. And that's precisely also what's inspired uh, people around the West to say, this is our fight too. And the Czech Prime Minister, for example, Petr Fiala, actually very specifically wrote that in an article. And everyone who does take that as being our fight too exactly wants to provide Ukraine with what it needs to win. And that's exactly what we should do. Um, I would push back also strongly against the suggestion that these weapons don't work. Mm. They've been consistently shown to work. And the tanks will certainly make a difference in doing combined arms warfare, um, offensive maneuver warfare, as Patrick rightly described, in Ukraine. Combined with air cover, they would be extremely effective. And again, Russia would stand to lose. The trouble with the escalation theory is that from Russia's side, they have nowhere to go with this against NATO or the West. We also have nuclear weapons. We also have weapons with which we could hurt them. So that's actually the balance of, of power that we see that works okay. deterrence both ways. All right, Jeffrey, your response to that. And what evidence is there that Russia is actually winning this war right now? The, the, the evidence is what's happening on the ground. 
uh, particularly uh, in the, the, the Donbass. The evidence of the 300,000 uh, additional reservists they've mobilized since these uh, Ukraine, successful Ukrainian counteroffensives uh, in the autumn, which haven't been, have been brought to, to bear back. The evidence of the huge casualties that the Ukrainians are, um, are, are suffering at the moment on the battlefield. And why do you think the Ukrainians are so, so desperate are the Russians, and so uh, yeah. rapturous about, the about, about these tanks? What? What? Why do you why why do you think the Ukrainians are, are, were so desperate to get this weaponry? Because the Russians have destroyed all, all the previous tanks and armored cars and other weapon weaponry. You know this 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 stuff that so look, they it, had it, destroyed it really all of them. They had they had they had nine hundred going into the into the war and they may have lost about four hundred. Yeah, but they've also captured no, no. five hundred uh, pa Russian tanks. Pa 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 Patrick Patrick Patrick, that is not the case, right? That's not the case, yeah. They've lost many, many, many more than that. And in terms of casualties, yeah, let's talk about the casualty figures. The Russians have suffered huge casualties. My estimate would be maybe yeah. 20,000 dead, maybe another 80,000 in missing, injured, all that. So 100,000 casualties. But what have been the casualties of the Ukrainians? At least 100,000 dead. Some people say 150,000. That, that might not be true. And several hundred thousand more. Um, uh, have been been wounded. So Ukrainian casualties three or four times higher okay. than Russian. So, Let's so allow who's Patrick losing? To who's winning and losing this war? Patrick, who's winning and losing this war? The, the, I just the, I don't certainly from my my understanding is you know that the casualty rate it, the the Russians are probably over thirty thousand dead and then a multiple of that times three or four wounded and Ukraine unfortunately is still quite high. We don't get the full picture because obviously it's operational security. But the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the in the United States said recently he reckons that the Ukrainians are about a hundred thousand casualties all in included their wounded, not dead. Okay. Mm -hmm. Obviously you've had yeah, and, 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 and the Ursula Van Ursia Van Leyen in her Sorry, Patrick, Versia Van Leyen, when she was speaking, uh, she, she, she said that there were, had been 100,000 Ukrainian officers uh, killed in the war. That's what she, that's what she, she said. She had to and clarify Miley her comments. She, she and had that to, comment, she has, had to no, 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 no. That comment, as far as I know, that comment has never been retracted. Never been retracted, right? Uh, Okay, gentlemen. It was retracted. But... All right, gentlemen, let's try and move the, yeah. the, the conversation and discussion forward. Benjamin, I want to come to you because Ukraine is now demanding more warfare, as we heard President Zelensky uh, say. Just looking at Germany specifically, can, can Germany cope with the pressures of demand without sacrificing its own defences? Yes, and there's a number of experts who've made this case. Um, I've talked about this for a long time. Also, Christian Merling, uh, Claudia Mayor, two of the leading German experts on security have made this case, which stands for almost all the Western allies, actually, is that what would be supplied to Ukraine would only be used to defend against Russia anyway. So actually tying Russia down and uh, diminishing its forces in Ukraine is a perfectly good use for these, these weapons. Uh, so supplying them actually does the job um, in a more effective way. Uh, it supports democracy, it supports Ukraine, and it actually degrades Russia's military capabilities, which would be the only thing they'd be used for anyway. So they can certainly be spared and more should be spared um, immediately. Just let me very quickly push back on what I think is really misinformation that's being uh, supplied uh, by certain other contributors to this show about casualties. Um, uh, those figures no, no, are not No, 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 get away with that. No, you cannot uh, accuse, sorry, you cannot accuse anyone of this information, right? That is completely out of order. Okay. Um, you can't do that. Gentlemen, no, gentlemen uh, please. You can't do that. So you cannot go on air and accuse someone of misinformation. Okay, gentlemen, please, let's try and continue this discussion in a civil manner. If you want to disagree with my information, if you want say I'm wrong oh. or you have alternative information, that's fine. Do. do not, do not accuse me of misinformation, deliberate misinformation. That's completely wrong. You've already shouted over everyone, showing all the discipline of a Russian mobilized unit. Uh, I suggest you get the figures right and also don't spread anti-Ukrainian propaganda, which is what's being done. And I okay. think it's it's Pat not uh, appropriate. So we need some independent oh, no, figures. Can I come back? Patrick, I'd like to, sorry. Okay. I'd like to, I'd okay, like to, can, I, can I please come back at that? Please, go please, ahead. I'd like to come Briefly, back at that. Briefly, if you like, can. Please. I want to clarify something here. I wanted to clarify, look, I, I'm not pro-Russian. I'm pro-Ukrainian. 
What I think about this war is that the longer it goes on, the worse it's going to be for Ukraine. The more that people like Christian and unfortunately Patrick as well get their way in terms of Western strategy, the greater the price that Ukraine is going to pay. It's at Western strategy, military strategy, political strategy, is actually going to end up destroying Ukrainian strength, which is why I want the war to stop as soon as possible. I want a ceasefire. I want peace negotiations. I want a settlement that can actually secure, safeguard, you know, Ukraine's future sovereignty right. okay. and independence. But the way okay, things are going at the moment, thing, we're talking about... Thing, gentlemen, we just have a few minutes yeah. left, and I, I, and I really do want to get your thoughts on, on where we think this is headed as we enter the second year now of this conflict. It's going to be a year in February. Uh, Patrick, let me come to you. What ways do you see this conflict going as the West continues to arm Kyiv? You know, could it conclude in the coming year, or... Uh, we're going to grind it, this into 2024 and see other countries directly involved, as feared? Uh, I, I don't think you're going to see uh, any countries directly involved with boots on the ground. No, no, no other countries, not for that. that, that that's a different level altogether. So I, I think it's going to try to be contained. I think we can expect, obviously, one, one major, maybe two major Russian counteroffensives between now and the summer. Uh, we'll see how they go, and Ukraine is going to have to weather that storm. Um, and I also think that Ukraine will be preparing, when the ground's harder, uh, their attacks to try and take back their lands. And we'll, if there's another, no one's ready to negotiate. And you know, if the if the Ukrainians wanted to, the people wanted peace, they, they, they could say that, and and they could go for it. But they think the costs are worth bearing at the moment. So you've got to respect that. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I think that maybe at the end of the summer that we, we will see it, there might be a space, a window of opportunity for some sort of negotiated settlement. Uh, but it can well drag on now. And, and it is a tragedy. It's an absolute tragedy. It's a human tragedy, um, first and foremost. OK. Uh, but me... it's not of Ukraine's making. Uh, Benjamin Tallis, your thoughts. What ways could the conflict go? Yeah, I think it's very important to listen to Ukrainians on that. I agree with what Patrick just, just said. Ukrainians don't want a negotiated solution at the moment because they don't have a trustworthy negotiating partner. And that's also a position that's been uh, confirmed by Washington and numerous times. But also we have to ask why they don't want to exist with their territory occupied by the Russian regime. Because we've seen the massacres, we've seen the brutal oppression that the Russians have put on uh, the people living in the occupied territories of Ukraine. So it's very understandable when 85 to 90 percent of Ukrainians say what they consider to be victory is Russia completely out of their territory. So not 21st of February borders, but 1991 borders. And that's precisely what we should be pushing for as well. Otherwise, we set a very dangerous precedent. Uh, we increase the likelihood of okay. nuclear proliferation and we undermine democracy. Jeffrey, you've got the last word. Where is this conflict headed? Um, I think it's probably heading in, in, in the direction that, um, that Patrick um, outlined. Just just a moment, uh, 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 just a moment ago. I think that's probably uh, the most um, uh, realistic uh, uh, sample. But I'd like to finish with, with this point: is that you know the war has lasted so long only because of Western support for Ukraine. Without that support, the war would have come to an end months ago. Hundreds of thousands of people's lives would have been saved. Ukraine would be in a, a much stronger position in terms of any peace settlement than it, than it is at the present time. Yes, the Ukraine. It's up to Ukrainian people and their government to do whatever they want. But Western citizens, their governments also have choices uh, to make here. And my okay. argument is, is that, that, that there needs to be a choice in favour of a return to diplomacy and uh, an effort at uh, 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 achieving a ceasefire okay. and uh, some kind of peace Gentlemen, negotiations. Gentlemen, we'll have to leave it there because we've run out of time. Thank you yeah. so much for a great discussion. Jeffrey Roberts, Benjamin Tallis and Patrick Bury. Thank you very much. And thank you too for watching. You can always watch this programme again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And of course, you can join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Fully, Batibo, and the whole team here in Doha, thanks for watching. Bye for now.